In the early 1990s, a group of superstar artists left Marvel Comics to found their own house, dubbed Image Comics. One of those creators, Jim Valentino, began an imprint within Image Comics called Shadowline, and within Shadowline, Shadowhawk, whose first issue featured a shiny and embossed cover that was Image Comics' first gimmick or enhanced cover, done by both Jim Valentino and Rob Liefeld. So let's jump into the history and the origin of Shadowhawk. Before Image and before Marvel, Bronx native Jim Valentino was doing work with Archie Comics, when an editor at the time named Scott Fulop was looking to revamp an old property called The Fox, who at that time Valentino envisioned as a more violent Batman. After that, while working on Guardians of the Galaxy at Marvel Comics, he was doing a story where Starhawk was inverted from light to dark, and he was going to change his name from Starhawk to Shadowhawk to reflect that. Marvel editor Tom DeFalco, though, didn't go for the pitch and suggested it to be a new character instead, this just before Valentino left for Image. So when Valentino was deciding what to do at Image Comics, he combined his Fox idea with DeFalco feedback on the Shadowhawk name, and a new character was born. Shadowhawk debuted to great success, selling over half a million copies of the first issue. It gave people a look at what DC Comics' Batman may look like if the reins were let go and he was allowed to maim his enemies, following in the footsteps of people like Alan Moore and Frank Miller. It didn't make sense to me, Valentino said, that Batman would keep letting people like the Joker go. So he explored that, but instead of killing, it would be bone-breaking violence. Paul Johnstone as Shadowhawk premiered in the summer of 1992's Young Blood issue 2, flanked by Young Blood powerhouses. This is the same issue that saw the debut of Liefeld's Prophet, and this was a five-page preview of Shadowhawk's upcoming finite series. Shadowhawk was featured in the summer of 92's Malibu Sun issue 16 in a piece named Call Him Shadowhawk. Those would be followed up by a special Ashcan book for a Comic-Con in Chicago that year with Shadowhawk right on the cover. So we'll get to Johnston's story and the other Shadowhawk named Eddie Collins, but to get there we have to jump forward and backward in time at the same time. And this is 1995's Shadowhawks of Legend by the likes of Kurt Busiek, Alan Moore, and Stan Sakai. It's revealed that Shadowhawk is an avatar for the spirit of justice, and different people through history have been the Shadowhawk. This story started with primordial gods known as Nomo. In the real world, Nomo were deities of the Dogon people of West Africa, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali, but had since spread out and become a broader, use Afrocentric term for how the power of word can create reality. On the Horn of Africa, at the dawn of human civilization, we find a tribe of peaceful villagers. One of them was jealous of the others, and he was called the Bone Man. He was an evil a sorcerer in contact with demons and dark art magics. He drew the spirit of justice out of humanity, then trapped it in a young boy, and then murdered the boy. And this brought evil into the world, giving rise to the bowman's power. At one point in Egypt of antiquity, a deity revealed itself to an Egyptian shaman who had just eaten some shrooms. Yes, those kind of shrooms, and likely not a microdose either, because he was seeing some serious shit in the sky. Presenting themselves on this mental plane was called the Mind Sea. This shaman took Nomo's teachings to other priests, but the priests were threatened by him and killed him. The assassins escaped and the shaman's spirit was denied its rest. The god Heru, or Horus, was angered by this and so he reincarnated the shaman and imbued him with power as the spirit of justice to collect the souls of people through time, ultimately trying to make the shaman's soul whole again. Horus also created a mystical book called Tome that helps protect the spirit of justice. Tome also has the power to possess living beings, physical forms, and manipulate their movements. Horus is not too dissimilar to Moon Knight's Egyptian god Khonshu, one a god of the sun and sky the other a god of the moon. The Shadowhawks would wear an armored helm called the Helmet of Heru. Different Shadowhawks have all worn different variations of the helmet, though all possess the same soul-collecting powers of the Nomo, allowing them to communicate like Jedi, and only when the new Chosen One wears it. The helmet also allows the Nomo spirits to take control of the Chosen One's body. Over history, the spirit of justice has possessed legions of people. Legends have been told of William Atherton, a Wild West cowboy Shadowhawk, Lord Takano, a samurai Shadowhawk who calls himself the Talons of Justice. There was also the Conan-esque Northern Hawk from 938 AD Norway, Lady Joanna, the Hawk Helm Knight from Ipswich, England in 1294, 1300's Hawk Delombro, who went through the plague, Henri Richard, and Halson Sombrio from 1519 Mexico, Hawk of the Seas and Hawk's Captain, a 1721 era pirate, Hawk's Wing and Shadwell Hawkins, a pioneer from the Ohio Territory of 1806, Hawk and his bird Shadow from 1830s era London, a World War I era pilot in 1918's Germany named Shadow Ace, 
and 1974's Shadowhawk Girl, along with many others. At the end of 94, a Shadowhawk special was published, which was dedicated to Bill Finger, a co-creator along with Bob Kane of DC's Batman. There were two stories, Images of Tomorrow and Images of Yesterday. This featured the Shadowhawk robot, and then Luke Hatfield Sr.'s Silver Age Shadowhawk in each story. That was a Silver Age DC parody of Batman. It Luke Hatfield Sr., who worked out of a shadow cave, had a shadow dog, drove a shadow car, and had a wife named Lady Shadow Hawkette. Okay, now back to Paul. Paul grew up in Harlem, New York City with his half-brother Hojo. He was a troubled youth, but worked with a social worker who helped him stay on the right path after he'd been arrested for theft. Eventually, Paul went to law school and became a lawyer, rising up to become a district attorney. As DA, he refused to accept mob money, and this came back to bite him when they assaulted Paul and injected him with blood that contained a human immunodeficiency virus. Of note, this is around the same time that Magic Johnson revealed his HIV status and retired from the NBA in 1991, and so this topic was very much a part of social discourse. Rob Liefeld touched on this too in Shadowhawk Issue Zero. The issue featured a Shadowhawk working with Bloodstrike, Mist, and Athena near the Austrian-Swiss border at Castle Brunick. USG had captured Shadowhawk in LA in Los Angeles when he was checking out a government research center. Mars Gunther, it turns out, needed an HIV-infected operative for a special job, coerced into a Sophie's Choice where he either helps or dies. That site near Austria was the Orpheus Foundation, a bioweapons facility that had weaponized the autoimmune disease. They blew up the facility and Shadowhawk demanded the cure from Gunther, but Gunther told them that that cure was with Dr. Orpheus, who was still a large. After Paul was injected with the blood, he didn't know if he'd been infected or not. But when his colleagues learned of the assault, a lot of bigotry and vitriol came Paul's way. He struck back one day, and this landed him in jail, which is when he learned he was HIV positive. Upon his release, some muggers attacked him and he wound up in the hospital, and this experience solidified his desire to fight back, to inflict painful spine-breaking justice on those who would do harm to others. Paul's friend Christina put him in touch with a guy named Carlton's son who happened to have an armored suit called Shining Knight that would help him in his fight. He got the suit while Christina trained him in acrobatics and martial arts. Paul became judge, jury, and executioner. He would be the justice where the legal system failed. He would break the backs of bad guys, trapping them in their own living prison. He became Shadowhawk, though still grossly unaware of his lineage, and he chose the name after his favorite childhood hero. Shadowhawk would leave his victims battered and bloody, becoming an urban legend that would be hunted by superheroes and villains alike. This included Arson, his own brother Hojo, Spawn, and Liquifier. Incidentally, Liquifier was created by Jim's son Aaron Valentino when he was just 8 years old. Aaron also created Taser Face when his dad was on Guardians of the Galaxy and was the model for Protégé. Shadowhawk also ran across Blackjack, Savage Dragon, and later some of those characters formed the Regulators team, and he encountered Chapel, with the two having an instant connection. He then took on a Hawk's Shadow. It would turn out much later during Music's run that Hawk's Shadow was the sidekick of that Silver Age Shadowhawk and his son, who'd now grown up and changed his name from Squirrel to Hawk's Shadow. Paul was in a standalone story in Image Zero, a mail away exclusive comic book where he protected a mother and her child from a killer in a subway station. That would later be reprinted in 93's Shadowhawk Out of the Shadows trade paperback. Johnston's condition got progressively worse, and with that, the severity of the beatings he doled out lessened, but his death grew ever closer. He became more desperate to find a cure, and this is when he encountered Gideon Trencher, a repossessor of souls, and his disembodied partner Phoebe. The pair helped him on his quest, a journey through time and space that caused his path to cross with, as I mentioned, the likes of Chapel from Young Blood. He then met the Wildcats team after Phoebe teleported him again, and he ended up at a wharf where Maul and Warblade were battling with the Black Razors. Spartan and Voodoo showed up later and tried to help him, thinking he was possessed by one of the alien race known as the Daemonites. They tried to put his body inside a spare Spartan android body, but that too failed. At one point, Shadowhawk ended up in the year 1963 when he encountered Richard Judge, aka the Fury, a pastiche character of Spider-Man, who introduced him to the Tomorrow Syndicate. When Shadowhawk told them about his blood virus and that a Soviet villain named Conrad Cockroach had spread it, they worked together to stop him while the Syndicate's own Horus tried to use the power in his staff to cure Shadowhawk to no avail. Shadowhawk then found himself with a team called The Others in a place called The Enclave. He'd gotten some medicine from Clone, but that didn't work either. This issue was dedicated to Gardner Fox, known for creating characters like DC Comics' Hawkman. When he met Supreme, the arrogant hero dismissed Shadowhawk, calling him a bothersome gnat. Disappointing as Supreme was one of Paul's childhood idols. He tried and failed to get some of Supreme's blood, but that fight knocked his helmet off and his identity was revealed. And that issue also featured a poster of Homer and Bart Simpson as Shadowhawks. Shadowhawk showed up in 1995 in Rob Liefeld's Bad Rock and Company. Phoebe ended up teleporting Shadowhawk right into Youngblood headquarters where he spilled onto the floor, still in agony from the pain of teleportation, and right to the feet of Bad Rock. 
Badrock told him he had a friend once, too, who was sick, that was Chapel, who ended up putting some lead into his own head. Badrock took him to the lab to make him another Badrock, even suggesting he change his name to Shadow Rock or Bad Hawk. A doctor commented on Shadow Hawk's low T-cell count and remarked that it was remarkable. He was even up and walking still, let alone doing super heroics. After some guys attacked the lab, Badrock punched one of them into the biotransference equipment and destroyed it, rendering the original idea useless. Badrock and Shadow Hawk parted ways with the big brute saying he would have been a great addition to Youngblood and Shadowhawk saying he kind of liked being in a group. Phoebe then teleported him away again and right into a New York City alleyway where he came across a spawn. And together Spawn and Shadowhawk battled a demon who'd taken on the form of Paul's brother. For a brief amount of time, Shadowhawk joined the brigade team. When Hawk's shadow attacked Shadowhawk's mother, he rescued her and defeated the villain. But it was this last ordeal that took Paul over the edge and he succumbed to his illness and passed away. The new Shadowhawk 7 issue series premiered in the summer of 95 by Kurt Busiek and artist James Fry with issues dedicated to Irish McCalla who'd starred as Sheena Queen of the Jungle in the 1950s. This is where the new Shadowhawk was out being his vigilante self and police chief Arturo Reeves had to figure out why knowing Paul had died. Sort of like when Superman died and we got Reign of the Supermen. Here we meet Iron Hawk, Shadow Kid, Shadow Kill, and Hawk Borg. Although that turned out to be a dream as the spirit of justice continued to call out. In the first issue, a college kid named Mickey Lippincourt stole a mystical book from Bernagot Books that, had, that ended up being the ancient being Tome. This would play into the upcoming Shadow Hunt story as Mickey used the book and Tome to travel through time and see Shadow Hawks of history. So here again we meet Christina Reed, the only woman to be kicked out of the NYPD, Police Lieutenant Lou Jacks, who was also an old army buddy of Bruce Stinson, aka Chapel, and Lincoln Sum, terrorist arms dealer brother of Carlton Sum, the Shadowhawk armorer. Which one of these was the new Shadowhawk? Shadowhawk took on Antonio Scrapelli's mob in Atlantic City and other parts of the region, then a creature named Glorch, one of the Red Bay mutants from the housing projects in Brooklyn. That very public fight put him on the radar of a female mercenary named Trophy. But before she arrived, he had to fight the junkyard dogs crew who were stealing parking meters. All this while a mysterious stranger monitored their activity with his cybernetic hawks. Trophy captured Christina to set her up as bait, a trap for Shadowhawk, but he'd sent Tome from a few minutes into the future to free Christina. That happened when the pair finally clashed. Shadowhawk kicked her in the face, yelling out, Mortal Kombat! He defeated Trophy and turned her over to Captain Reeves. He then fought Joe Blowfish and his secretary, Miss Houghton. So that brought on the inevitable Hootie and the Blowfish reference that got one of the minions choked out. Shadowhawk ended up in the middle of a conflict between Blowfish, Scrapelli, Vendetta, and Tony Twist. He eventually caught up with and fought Blowfish at his place on Coney Island. After a group planted six bombs in six cities, Shadowhawk teamed up with Brigade again to find and defuse them. Vanguard had invited him to try out for membership and he came to see what was what. It had been his predecessor who joined Seahawks Brigade previously, so Shadowhawk took New York City, quickly running into the junkyard dogs yet again, but this time they ended up helping him, and together they found and defused the bomb. Meanwhile, another Shadowhawk had found and rescued the police captain from captivity, but he'd rescued Christina, catching her with a Shadowhawk helmet in her hands, thinking her to be Shadowhawk. Tome encountered his foil, the Bone Man, the same guy who'd sent Bone Soldiers through time to stop the Shadowhawks. Shocking to the captain, Shadowhawk appeared in his window and delivered the gas house rapist to him. Now he was confused. Christina was in custody, so who the hell was Shadowhawk? That's when Julie Newberry from Halo Industries approached Captain Reeves to tell him that one of their robots, a Shadowhawk robot, had disappeared from storage. So it turns out there was more than one answer. There were multiple Shadowhawks. And it's here that we learn that the spirit of justice was fragmented and had been torn apart eons ago by the Bone Man. The spirit would live on in at least four Shadowhawks that operated at the same time, but were spread across the globe to be fully independent of each other. The Bone Man caused this spread to keep the spirits fragmented and their power weakened. When the spirit came together as the four Shadowhawks fought Bone Man, he was defeated and the spirit became the invincible Shadowhawk robot. And lacking humanity, the Shadowhawk robot descended into a twisted version of justice and soon became a target of the FBI and people like Chapel and the Young Blood team. The hunter had now become the prey. This robot met its demise in New Man issue 4 in the spring of 1994, right around the same time that a kid named Eddie Collins moved from the Midwest to New York City with his father who'd recently lost his wife. And so when the robot was destroyed, the spirit of justice transferred to Eddie, with New Man presenting him with the helmet, and he became the new Shadowhawk. In one interview, Valentino said he was getting tired of superheroes in general and that Shadowhawk in particular had become tiresome. He was doing a guy who was dying of AIDS and breaking people's backs, and yep, that'll get you up and put a smile on your face every day. This new Shadowhawk is a kid. I liken him to the very young Spider-Man. He's digging it. He does backflips off of buildings yelling, wahoo, which do you think you'd prefer to do? 
On September 4th of 1996, Liefeld issued a press release that he was resigning from Image the same day the board was sent to vote on his removal. About a month later, he sued Image for $7.6 million in damages. That's when Jim Lee left and took Wildstorm Studios with him, ultimately finding a new home at DC Comics in 98. When Larry Martyr also left, Valentino became publisher at Image Central. In Shattered Image in 96, Shadowhawk began to exist in his own sub-reality when six Earths appeared side by side, a mini-crisis on infinite Earths. Savant and Zealot came to him for help and brought him to the Youngblood base at the Pentagon. Shaft dispatched them to fight Covenant and Entropy with others like Savage Dragon, Barbaric, and Ripclaw. And it's here that he met Vampirella again as reality shattered. She tried to coax him back to her. Reality was fixed, but that story also served to remove Silvestri and Jim Lee's studio from Image since Lee and Liefeld were going at it. That Vampirella reference was because in the 1995 crossovers between Shadowhawk and Vampirella, the protagonists were taking on foes together like the Bloodhawks and the Cult of Chaos as the villains tried to kill the Pope. Oh, and he fell in love with Vampirella and she bid him to turn him into a vampire, which also cured him of his affliction in those non-canon stories, which is why he says he didn't know her. In Altered Image in 98, Eddie Collins met with Savage Dragon Spawn Majestic in the Max at police headquarters where he worked, and they needed help fixing reality. Shadowhawk was on the cover of Robert Kirkman's Invincible Issue 8, mourning the death of the Guardians of the globe. He was in the book too, but he didn't say anything. In Return of the Shadowhawk, he fought with a villain named Cutlass while the Nomo tucked loudly in his helmeted head. It's when Paul came to Eddie and told him that he's the last Shadowhawk, that it was his turn, and to accept the helmet that New Man had given him. The Return of Shadowhawk was Eddie's first full-length solo comic. He was then in the Image Holiday Special in 2005 in a story called Just Another Christmas Story. Valentino's second volume of Shadowhawk in 05 dove into Eddie's story more. Here he crossed paths with people like Backlight, whom he accidentally killed, Zap, Nocturne, his encounter with Hawk's Shadow, the female Blacklight, who'd helped him fight Corpse, who was the Blacklight he killed in issue one, then Rebound, who also has ties to Bomb Queen, and an arsonist named Philip Marco. It all started to take a toll, and Collins lost his girlfriend Colleen and his spot on the basketball team. And to make it worse, a monster named Komodo beheaded Eddie's friend Ski right in front of him. Hatfield, Hawk's Shadow, showed up to take over the mantle for a time. Eddie's father and Blacklight had to console him, while the other Shadowhawk went out on a killing spree. His friend's parents forgave him, revealing they knew his identity as Shadowhawk. Then the Nomo said Shadowhawk was his destiny, so he chose to go out there and take it back from the imposter. They battled until Blacklight and Astroman held him back from killing Hatfield. His first time back out brought him into contact with a lady, apropos, named Rebound. He accidentally helped her steal a car while hitting on her and while Nocturne watched from afar. The corpse attacked again and he saved Rebound and the two ended up hooking up to close out his first series. In 2005's The Pact, Shadowhawk teamed up with Invincible Zephyr Noble from Noble Cause Fire Breather, and later Quantum Girl to form a team called, well, The Pact. On the cover, it looks like they're battling a red Fing Fang Foom, but that's actually Belloc, King of the Monsters. Shadowhawk was now armed with a shield and a sword, his armor liquid metal that could form different armaments. This happened while he was battling the dragon. When they got together, they hung out at their base on the moon and went there when some asteroid monsters attacked. A window broke and Shadowhawk was sucked out into the vacuum of space and realized his suit protected him even out there. Issue 4 had a fun World's Finest 195 cover homage where Invincible was Superman and Shadowhawk was Batman. Inside they fought with Doc Seismic. Shadowhawk appeared in 2006's Bomb Queen vs. Blacklight 2 before the two ladies collided in Las Vegas. Valentino once again teamed up with artist Chance Wolf for a standalone story that was originally published in the Image Comics hardcover which found Eddie and his father James Collins needing to come to terms with what Shadowhawk means. In Bomb Queen 4, Shadowhawk was helping fire rescue after a bomb went off. In 2008, Shadowhawk teamed up with Savage Dragon, Invincible, Witchblade, and Spawn to to stop Solar Man. They later teamed up again to fight the Terranians. In 2009, Shadowhawk again appeared in Invincible, this time with all the other image characters for the Invincible War, where he was beating up an alternate Mark Grayson with Madman. Shadowhawk was back in Bomb Queen's Newport City in Bomb Queen 6, fighting someone called Captain Muffmonger. Blacklight helped out until Bomb Queen started sniping their friends from a rooftop. So Obama then sent all the heroes for Operation Queenfall to take down Bomb Queen. In 2009's Image United miniseries, Shadowhawk was at Youngblood headquarters with Troll waiting to try out for the team, but they were off dealing with Overt Kill, an old Liefeld villain from the early days of Spawn. But that series was dead in the water after Todd stopped working on it and Liefeld lost the rights to Youngblood. In the story, Eddie was beaten and left in a coma by an Omega Spawn demon, and so his father had the Nomo sacrifice himself to save his son. That's when Paul was revived to take up the mantle while Eddie was off 
the board. Jim Valentino revisited Paul in his 2010 five issue series. He continued fighting villains like Killswitch while dealing with ghosts from his past. He took on Eve Honer too. Scotty Young's Gert ran into Shadowhawk and some image heroes when they were at a nightclub. And then he appeared in 2022 in The Last Shadowhawk, which is a book that celebrated the 30th anniversary of Shadowhawk's debut. The story took place in the near future. The Noma wanted to revive Paul, but he was tired and done. Speaking of being done, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.